Good morning, Brighton. Come on, don't give me that response. Good morning, Brighton. So real quick, I want to shake things up a little bit. Uh, 15 seconds before I start. If you could all just stand up for me quickly, wherever you are. We often come to these things and we, we shimmy in our seats and we don't really you know, connect or engage. You go to the breaks, we don't make new friends. So for 10 seconds, I want you guys to introduce yourself to someone you didn't come with. Tell them your name, where you're coming from, who you are. Go. That's time. That's time. They've given me a short period. I know you guys have gone for ages. But I just wanted to do that. And that's time. We can sit, we can take our seats. I just wanted to do that because I believe the power of connection is something that's really important. We often don't exercise it. We're on a train with random human beings. You often don't crack a smile. And so I just wanted to give you guys that. And you know, in the break time, maybe continue some of those conversations. So my name is Sifas Williams, uh, and the title of my talk today is Stop Killing Black Men. And I'm dyslexic, uh, and so I'll be reading from my slides from time to time as it helps me present. Uh, it's not the wisest thing to do as someone who suffers from dyslexia and public speaking, uh, but whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger, um, or could end up seriously embarrassing me on YouTube in front of millions of people. But we'll give it a go anyways. <clears throat> so stop killing black men. Uh, and I'll start with Einstein's definition of insanity. Uh, doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. And I say here, um, if this is the case, uh, why do we continue to build bespoke coffee shops, exclusive art galleries, throwing money into affordable housing that's only really affordable to the few uh, and after doing all these things over and over again, expect a community of peace, hope, and prosperity. And I say here, by the end of this talk, I would have shown you the single greatest killer of black men, and it won't be a gun, and neither will it be a knife. Uh, and I pose the question, who's building our communities? And there's this interesting project that stood out to me when I studied architecture called the Torre David. Um, in Caracas, uh, Venezuela. And it was a unique circumstance where the developer dies, um, and at the same time, you have hundreds of people who are made homeless. And they all migrate to this uh, shelling core building uh, in a very unique and peculiar situation, uh, and they cre create and curate the facade you see here. So all these different moments were created and curated by the community. And anyone that's interested in this kind of stuff, I'd urge you to look into the Torre David. And as such, uh, for me, I say, you know, now I'm not wishing death uh, on developers in the UK, uh, but at some point, there has to be a conversation with the communities whose homes are being destroyed and subsequently their lives. Uh, and how do we bring great architecture and authentic programming to the community? And so for me, in 2017, I set up Drummer Boy Studios. Uh, and Drummond Boy Studios is my vision realized for bringing great architecture and great programming to my community. Uh, and on the commercial arm, we're looking at operating as a co-working space, tenancy space, and creative facilities for people within the community, because sometimes the disadvantage isn't poverty, sometimes the disadvantage is access. Uh, and on the social level, we're looking at how we can connect these creative industries to the worlds of music, film, media, enterprise, fashion, game, and the rest. Uh, and by doing so, I'm, I'm posing the question of how do you widen participation and further engage people who don't generally get engaged in these industries. And we look at these industries, they're not diverse, and particularly with the black community, you don't see many faces uh, and many people employed from the community. And so I pose the question, would you employ this kid? And take a good look at this image, I'll come back to it a bit later on. And so the notion goes, and you know, the impetus for John Boy Studios was, you know, they're knocking down buildings in the, in the community for an idea of a better city. And I pose the question, you know, who are these people uh, and where do they go uh, in the wake of gentrification? And what does hope and prosperity look like for this child? 
And I say here, it's not their fault, but this is the visual image that's taken over a lot of the communities that I lived in and grew up in, uh, alongside bespoke coffee shops and bars. And there's a disconnect between this narrative and this one. And I found this cool image, and it says, Condos killed culture. And I'll add something a bit more topical to the UK. Uh, build aspiration and not just apartments. And so that's what I set out to do. I walked away from my part to in architecture. I took money I was saving to buy a house. Uh, and I took over a shop in Peckham, South East London. It was a derelict shop. And we wanted to turn it into the first studio. Uh, and me and a small team of people, you know, blood, sweat, and tears really came together to bring this place to life. And there's this quote I come up with when I was severely depressed and suicidal many years ago. And the quote reads, your belief is subject to your understanding. Your belief is subject to your understanding. It goes on to read, the older you get, the more you understand, the less you believe. The younger you are, the less you understand, the more your appetite for belief. And the quote goes on to read in full, your information informs your understanding, as, in, as does your understanding inform your belief, as does your belief inform your action, your actions. Uh, and so I say you must diversify your information intake uh, to diversify your actions. And so this was an act of belief, uh, and also uh, it was an act of something I believed from what I was informed was possible. And here's a few images uh, of the studio as, as it was when, we, when we'd finished creating it. And I say here, um, I was the only 27 at the time, 27-year-old black man uh, with a shop on Peckham High Street in a population that was majority black. And for me, you know, I say, what does this say about the local economy? and ideas around social mobility. And here's a few more images of the studio uh, as it ended up being created, and some of the activities we had uh, in the studio. And it was a success. It was really well received. Uh, we were looking at scaling up. Um, I'd engaged a lot of people from within those industries uh, that I mentioned, from CEO down, who were looking to engage, as well as one of the largest architectural practices uh, in Europe had been confirmed to be my development partner to now scale this project. At the same time, we were in conversations around the 70 million pound regeneration match fund to redevelop the community. Now, at the same time, I was receiving backlash from a very crooked landlord who didn't want us to exist. He'd pegged it on rent, but we were paying our rent. The building was owned by the council, but the council was extremely unsupportive. Um, and they had lied and said the building be, knock be, be being knocked down soon. The building still stands there today. Uh, and they just wanted us out for a reason I couldn't understand. And it was a frustrating period for me, where I ended up sleeping in the studio for weeks at risk of an unfair or unlawful eviction. At the same time, you know, the, the, the mainstream narrative, I guess, of someone that looks like me is that I shouldn't be doing half of the things I'm doing. And I felt like this is why I was receiving all the stumbling blocks and issues I was facing. And so I decided to set up 56 Black Men, which I'll explain a bit more later. And it came from a Sky report that was put out at the time that 56 Black people uh, had been killed, and I felt that the visual image attached to that statistic was black men. And often, it wouldn't be a, a black woman, a white man, a white woman, Asian. It would be a black man that you see as that visual image of the people being killed in the community. And as part of my message for 56 black men, uh, I say, why is it that every time I see a black man in a newspaper, he's either a victim or a perpetrator of knife crime or violence? I say here, Many of us are against injustice, but the beauty of our bubble doesn't enable us to act on the injustice we see. And so how can you help directly or act right now? And so the brainchild of 56 Black Men uh, was one of a few things, but one being 56 Black Men Live, which is where I aim to bring great storytelling uh, and great performance art to the stage so that black men can take control of their narrative uh, and lead on, that, lead on that as such. And here's a few images from uh, the event we, we, we held last week uh, to launch the program. And it was a success. It was a sold out show. Uh, and if you're interested, please engage with us online. Uh, so at 56 Black Men on all platforms, and myself at Sifas Williams on all platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and we're also looking to partner with organizations to further bridge the gap uh, and bring more black men into the workplace, as well as shine a positive light on the ones that already are. But this doesn't affect me, some may say. This isn't my problem. And so I'll touch on a quick story. It's a famous poem, hopefully I'll do it justice. 
and it's about two farmers, a man and a woman, and they have this mouse problem. Uh, and the mouse, the lady sets up a mouse trap downstairs, and the mouse goes around to all the farm animals, including a snake, uh, a chicken, a pig, and a cow. And he goes to all the animals, like, please, you know, they've set up a mouse trap for me. Can you help me remove the trap? You guys are bigger, stronger than me. You've got different mobility skills. You, know, you can do it. And everyone says, it's not my problem. And so the first person to get caught in the trap is a snake. And the lady goes downstairs to reveal what she believes will be the mouse uh, and finds it's the snake. The snake bites the lady. Uh, it's a poisonous snake. She goes to the hospital. The snake dies. Uh, and the snake is the first one to realize actually it was a snake's problem too. Now, the lady gets discharged from hospital, but she's a bit feverish. Uh, and what do you do when people are ill? You make them chicken soup. And so, you know, the chicken soon realized that it was also the chicken's problem. And the lady gets a bit more ill, and more people come around to show, you know, condolence. And what happens when you have more guests? You need more food. And so the pig soon realizes that it was the pig's problem too. And then the lady dies. Yeah, I wish it was a better ending. I didn't make up the story, but she dies. And you have more people come around, you know, uh, and the, the cow gets it because you need more food for more guests. And so the cow soon realizes that also it was the cow's problem too. And the moral of the story is, just because the problem doesn't directly affect you doesn't mean the ripple effect won't. Now I'm going to hone in on the problem I'd like to detail today. And this is the first and exclusive time you'll be able to see a picture of a 12 to 13 year old me rapping. It's there, two, three, gone. All right. <laughs> so, and I say, it's funny, but what this shows us is how impressionable and malleable we can be in the presence of an over amplified singular narrative. And I say here, show black men as one thing over and over and over again, and that is all they'll believe they can become. So it's no surprise that I also wanted to be a professional football player, a professional basketball player. And I say here, uh, I seriously considered these things when I was young. Had a famous American executive uh, reached out to sign me at a young stage of my life, I may have seriously considered a career in this thing. I say it again, show black men as one thing over and over and over and over again, and that is all they will believe they can become. Show black men the reality of our capabilities uh, and who we can become, um, and we can become anything. I'll say that again. This is dyslexia kicking in, bear with me. Show black men the reality of our capabilities uh, and we can become anything. And that's the birth of 56. Uh, and this was my vision realized to show and spotlight black men in a bid to challenge the negative stereotypes of black men in the media. And there's 56 of them. And if you've not seen it already, I urge you to look at, look at it online. Uh, and it was received extremely well. It see, it's since received global traction and global news. We've been featured everywhere from the BBC to The Guardian. Uh, and, you know, it features a plethora of men from various career paths. And I say here, because of the inadequate representation of black men, uh, we have not been authentically visible through mainstream media for a very long time. And this singular narrative of the black man's identity is not only detrimental to our image throughout the wider society and how people view us, but to our personal belief and understanding about ourselves. We're all too familiar with the cliche story of a black boy who was brilliant academically or creatively, but became a victim or perpetrator of knife crime, gun crime by another black man or perhaps the police. Or ends up giving up along his journey, falling into depression that he never speaks about because society painted black men to be the toughest people in the room at all times. But what if this black boy knew? Hold that thought for a minute.
What if this black boy knew that it was okay to cry, it was okay to show emotion, feel low and communicate how you feel to the people around you? What if this black boy knew? What if this black boy knew that wearing a hoodie or other casual clothing was not the uniform for negative behavior? And what if this black boy knew that his brother was not his enemy? And what if this black boy knew that he was well within his rights to eat at that posh restaurant or five-star hotel or walk into the art gallery or sit down with that CEO of the company and have a professional or business conversation? What if that black boy knew? And what if that black boy knew that one day he could be an astronaut or a pilot or one of the greatest painters or writers we'd ever seen in this world? But what if that black boy knew that one day he would be the president of the United States of America? or the Prime Minister of Great Britain. <laughs> but first to that point, what if you knew? What if all of you knew? Would you view black men differently? When did this become the uniform for violence and negativity? And I say here, if the media continues to show black men in a negative light and the general public continues to believe it, what does this say about the trajectory of black men and black boys globally. Remember I told you guys something at the beginning of this talk. You remember? Come on, give me some life, guys. <laughs> I'm not changed, I'm still the same. <laughs> <laughs> you remember I told you something by the end of this talk, I said, I would have shown you the single greatest killer of black men, and it won't be a knife, and neither will it be a gun. And the truth is, this singular narrative killed more black men and more black dreams than knife crime or violence ever could. I've been Sifas Williams. Stop killing black men. <laughs>